Our scripture text today is found in Luke chapter 18. So if you could turn there, please, Luke chapter 18. Uh, we're going to start in verse 18. This is part of um, the, ser the sermon series, People We Meet and Lessons We Learn. And today's sermon title is called The Rich Young Ruler. But uh, first of all, I'm going to read um, Luke 18, <clears throat> starting in verse 18. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he, asked, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to come through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? And he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, <clears throat> see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, I, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left um, house or wife, or brothers, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. After ta taking the twelve, he said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished, for he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise." But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did, did not grasp what was said. May God bless the reading of this word. Amen. Morning, Waterdam. It's good to be with all of you. Uh, yesterday, uh, Steve mentioned that we were at a graduation, and we finally, our last child has now graduated college, which is hard for us to believe. As you saw, we still see her. I still see her as that kid on that little thing there that, I don't know what it was. What was it? Okay, ladybug. And uh, I used to call her Spike because her hair always stood up on end. And uh, uh, it was just kind of fun to, uh, to see that. I haven't seen that picture for a long time. But one of the things that uh, the students uh, did was they were commissioned to go into their uh, respective fields of study and to go further in the direction of their life. And that Friday night, though, was a baccalaureate service where we heard Reverend Dr. Dean Weaver encourage these kids to run the race with resiliency and endurance. But they're going to need that as they face the world. And that his message came out of uh, Hebrews um, chapter 12, where he says, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and that let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set out before us. Now, before I go into the sermon uh, today, I just want to say that I remember Carol Davis very well and uh, she was one of those witnesses. Um, Carol's life was about her faith and that she was around people all the time uh, she was never at a loss of words, and she was never missed an opportunity to try to witness to whoever was around her. And she was, loved teaching. She was a wonderful teacher, and she ran a preschool. And she even went just recently, about a year ago, to help us with a feasibility study about preschools. We went all the way up to uh, Pathways to talk to them, and Carol went along with us to ask questions, and she was vigorous about it. And she always she was, had a dream that she would see a preschool here someday. And, um, but her celebration of life uh, will honor her memory on this Friday coming up here at the church at 11 a.m. So we invite you to come back to that and pray for her family. Also, please continue to pray for Elaine. I know that uh, Steve mentioned it, but that was an emergency situation this morning that she went into the hospital. And Wayne reached out for us to ask us to pray. So we will definitely be praying for Elaine's AFib to uh, calm down, as they say. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask now that you would just bless our time. 
as we come before you, that we know that we are running the race that you marked out for us, that that race is filled with ups and downs, hills and valleys. And so, Lord, we just ask you to help us with the endurance. In that same passage, you continue to keep, keep, to tell us to keep our eyes on Jesus and to lay aside anything that encumbers, that every weight and every sin which clings to us, that we need to keep our eyes on Christ and lay aside those things that are not of Christ. Sometimes those things are good. Sometimes they're sinful uh, attitudes. Lord, help us to know that we need to come to Christ. We need to run to Christ like this rich young ruler did, and we need to kneel down and submit ourselves to him, but we need to be willing to give up anything that it costs for us to follow Jesus, to put our trust in him. And so we do pray for that for all of our families, our graduates, today as we think about this, and we thank you for all the kids that are uh, here at the church, and we pray as we try to bring them up in this home, uh, that this place would prepare them for their permanent home. We ask, Lord, now that you would bless us and be with us this morning. We pray for Carol's family as they prepare for the celebration of life this Friday. We also lift up Elaine, that you would calm her heart, and that the doctors would be able to assure them that she's going to be all right, and that they could take any means necessary to slow that heart down, and to put it back in rhythm. Pray for Wayne as he takes care of his wife. We pray for Mary Bacardi as she recovers, and just ask, Lord, for um, your strength for, for um, Ray Melangowski. We love him, and we ask, Lord, that you would just strengthen him. Pray for all of our church family that are home and that are watching us online, and for those downstairs that we want them to know that they're loved and included in this, this sense of being together as a church family, this community of faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, one of the things that Dr. Weaver did remind the, the kids is that they had been surrounded by um, friends and family, that they, they had faculty around them, this great cloud of witnesses, and that they're not meant to go the race alone. They're not meant to go alone in the race. And... Uh, we think about that as we heard Kate tell us a story about a professor that touched her life, that she had one class with this guy, and uh, she was uh, by herself in the class. She would sit up front, and he always knew her name, and he would recognize her. He, she had, he had 80 students, and he would see her on the hallway. He would recognize her, and he would say hello. And then she remembers when he shared from the Bible some scripture that he wanted to share with the kids, that he actually had a concern and cared for them, they wanted to minister to their spirit. And we are thankful for that type of a professor, a teacher. Teachers are important. They say teachers change lives, and the lives of millions of people have been changed by a teacher they met in grade school or high school or college. Good teachers have a deep imprint. And the American author Philip Wiley said, one good teacher in a lifetime can sometimes change a delinquent into a solid citizen. As we think about teachers, Jesus was the most famous teacher, the most transformative teacher there's ever been. And then we see this young ruler come up to Jesus, and he calls him a good teacher. He has a way of teaching because he's uncovering the deeper issues of life that Jesus so often does with people. Isn't that what he does? They, they come with him with a question, and the, this young ruler comes to him with the right question. He asks him about inter, entering, inheriting the kingdom of heaven. But there's something wrong, again, with this young upstart. And uh, we notice that there's a theme again from Luke about entering the kingdom of heaven and that we need to be saved. How can we be saved? You hear the disciples when Jesus says that it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven than an, a camel getting through the eye of a needle. What he's saying is that it's impossible by man's own effort. We do not have the ability to save ourselves. Human effort won't do it. We have to know that Jesus is uncovering us here as well in this portrait of this young, rich ruler. And so we need to understand that that theme is coming out again about entering the kingdom of God and how can we be saved. It's all throughout chapter 18. And Luke is introducing us to this young man who is certainly impacted by Jesus' teaching, and he's eager to learn. That's what's so amazing about him is that he's eager to learn. He comes running up to Jesus according to Mark's gospel in chapter 10. He runs up to Jesus. 
And so he's wanting to learn from Jesus. Perhaps he's heard about Jesus. And if there was ever somebody that would be brought onto the team of the disciples, this guy ought to be, you know, in the running. I mean, he comes up, he's run up, he kneels down before Jesus, and he asks the right question about entering the kingdom of God. What must I do, he says, to inherit eternal life? And so if you're going to look uh, for a mentee or a, a person to join your team, you would think that Jesus would want him to be a part of his team. So let's look at this young, rich ruler. We're going to look at the rich, young ruler, and then we're going to talk about one thing you lack, and then treasure in heaven. Those are our three points for today. So hopefully it'll move uh, real uh, quickly through some of the material. But it also we're going to address something that's shocking about this passage. Rich young ruler is found in verse 18 there. If you would, you turn in your Bibles to verse 18 and keep that open. Notice the ruler asks him, good teacher. He calls him good teacher. And uh, that's not something that you would normally do with a rabbi. You wouldn't call him good because they all know that this would be part of Jewish teaching, that there is only one good, that is God. And notice that's what Jesus does. The young ruler may be trying to flatter Jesus. We don't know, but he's, maybe he's just, you know, just overwhelmed by coming up and seeing Jesus, and to which Jesus immediately drives him back to God. He says to him that uh, no one is good except God. And now we use term, the term good all the time, so we're, we're kind of... Uh, Flipping about it, we don't, good dog, they're a good person, they're a good man, it's a good car. We, we, we say good all the time. But, but this is about a, a man's life. We, we talk, you hear people say that about a person. They'll say they're a good person. We like, we're, we're easy to say it. But Jesus doesn't even want to be called, but he does want to be called good because he is God, right? Nevertheless, we learn from Mark's gospel that he's enthusiastic about learning. So we know that he's a, he's a certain ruler he, he is enthusiastic, he's humble, Mark shows us. He runs up and he kneels before Jesus, which shows that he's got humility, that he's sincere. He's got a deep thought in his mind, and the, so he comes to Jesus. So he comes to the right person, right? He comes to the right person. And uh, we know that he is a ruler. We know that he's young. Matthew tells us that he's young in age. He's called the young, young man, a certain young man, approached. Jesus in verse 20 of Matthew 19. And then number three, uh, we know that he is a ruler, that he has accomplishments, right? So his age is he, a factor. He's got, a, he's got some accomplishments on his resume, and we know that he's rich. He's affluent. He's, he's got a good portfolio. And uh, if anybody was going to make it, make the team, it would be this guy. And uh, notice what it says uh, in 23, it says, in verse 23 of Luke, we learn that he's extremely rich. And in verse 23, he says, but when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And in Matthew 19, verse 22, it says, when the young man heard this, after he heard Jesus tell him something that was lacking in his life, he had, for he had great possessions. So he has money and possessions. He's enthusiastic, he's young, he's a ruler. He's got accomplishments, he's affluent, and he's religious. He's religious. I mean, he asks the question. It's, it's not a flippant question. He's not asking Jesus a flippant question. He's asking him about eternal life. But in the mindset of the Jewish society, he would be seen as favored by God. This, this guy was favored by God because of his wealth, and that's what they would think. And so Jesus tells him, though, there's one thing that he's lacking. And what is that one thing that he's lacking? Well, I think it's important for us to look at it. So despite his age, his accomplishments, and his affluence in his heart, he has a sense, though, that there is something missing in his life. There's a missing, something missing that causes him to run up to Jesus. And what is he thinking about? He's thinking about his home after this life. He's talking about going home. And one of the things that they emphasized, one of the students came up and talked about feeling homesick. I remember when Kate went and she called Melissa that first night, that evening. I heard Kate's voice. I'm ready to pack in the, get packed in the car and go get her. Melissa's sitting there. We're on the, in the bed. We're laying there. And Melissa said, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine, honey. It'll get better. It's going to get better. 
And uh, they told them to open their door, and, and Kate opened her door so people, the students, know to come in. That's one of the things that we loved about Grove City is that they encouraged that fellowship. You're not running the race alone. You're not meant to be in isolation. But we had that phone, and when I got that phone call, I, we were ready, I was ready to go. I would have put her back in the car and enrolled her in any school she could live at home for the rest of her life. But Melissa was a little bit more astute, and she said, you'll be fine. Not that she wasn't <laughs> pulled at the heartstrings, but we are, we get homesick. And then the, there was a girl that came up, and she talked about how Grove City became their home, their home away from home, and how that home was actually preparing them for their permanent home. You know, HGTV always talks about your forever home, and uh, we, we think about that a lot, but there is a homesickness about us that we need to understand. And this ruler recognizes that there's a homesickness for heaven in his heart. Ecclesiastes tells us that, doesn't it? In chapter 3, that God has set eternity in the heart of every person that you meet. And that our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. That's the St. Augustine uh, quote that people love to quote. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. This young man was rich, but he wasn't satisfied. He had all the accoutrements of life, all the privileges, but he hadn't found his, his uh, hope in his money. He hadn't found it in his achievements or even in his youth. He's still struggling, and like a lot of young people, he's struggling with this question that's going on inside of him. What do we know about this young person? Well, he came to the right person. We said that earlier. And that Jesus was tempted without sin. And yet he faced every temptation that you and I will ever face. And yet he was without sin. You say, if you're young, you say, well, there's some things that I cannot resist. Even older people probably could say that. There are some things that I cannot resist. Jesus knows that. You, you see, when you come to Christ, he gives you his Holy Spirit. He frees you from being a slave to sin. His Holy Spirit allows you to overcome your temptations, to do things that are, are, to do things that are impossible for you to do in your own strength. To free you from bondage. He came to the right person. Secondly, he came running. And one of the things that I want you to notice is that he came running up to Jesus and he knelt before him. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. Proverbs 18.10. Isaiah 55 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. A call upon him while he is near. He came to him while he was young. And as you get older, there's something that happens to our hearts that makes our hearts can become hardened. The same sun that, that what is that, melts the snow, hardens the clay. You ever heard that saying? That he came to him at the right time, too. He was young. As you get older... We have to be careful that our hearts become, don't become hardened. We come, become less likely to come to Christ. Did you know that there's statistics out there about that? By the age of 13, it's almost completely in place. Barna's worldview research discerns the presence of a biblical worldview and questions about biblical inerrancy, the character of God, the life of Christ, absolute moral truth, and salvation by faith. Surveys done by the Barna Research Group indicate that American children 5 to 13 have a 32% probability of accepting Christ. But youth or teens aged 14 to 18 have only a 14% 14 probabil 14 probability of doing so. Unbelieving adults aged 19 and over have just a 6% probability of becoming Christians. I'm not saying it's impossible as you get older. I'm just saying that it gets harder for people to receive it. That's a scary thought. How important it is to bring your children early to Christ. 
and that we're not meant to run the race in isolation, that we're not meant to run it by ourselves. We're supposed to be part of a family, a, a family that will encourage our faith. And the models, the models for people, family, faculty, friends, parents, and other people, other believers. And so that's the great cloud of witnesses. Today is the day of our, your salvation. Come now to Christ. Proverbs 29.1 says, He who is often reproved yet, reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. This young man came to the right person at the right time with the right attitude. And that he knelt down before Jesus. That he had humility. Despite all he had gone for him, he still needed something. Billy Graham said he is deeply concerned about eternal life, that he had a need. And he says, you can almost feel this young man's excitement. Well, he didn't say that. I said that. But, but, but you get the point that, that Graham was saying that we need to acknowledge our need for God. The young man has a need to know how to enter the kingdom of God. And what he's asking is, how, do you, how are you saved? He came to the right person, and Jesus is the right person to come to, friend. He came with the question, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Billy Graham said he made one mistake. He thinks he can work it out for himself. I heard that song in my head, we can work it out. That's not the way, the rhythm of it. I can't sing. We can work it out. Can't work it out. And so he asks Jesus, he comes up to Jesus, he kneels before him, and, and Jesus tells him this. He, he comes up to him and he starts naming off, Jesus names off these commandments. And then after he gets done saying, he says, one thing you still lack. Sell all your possessions that you have. Distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. He says to Jesus, what must I do? My friend, you can't do anything to enter in heaven in your own strength. You can't do anything to save yourself. There is nothing you can do to have your sins forgiven. You can't do anything other than come to Jesus. So Jesus begins by asking him if he knows the commandments. And you can imagine this young man. He's saying... Oh, yeah, he starts listening to Jesus. He starts listening to the list of Jesus. And so Jesus is showing this young man. He says to him in verse 29 there, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you can see him, how he's passing the test and how his pride had to be starting to be growing up inside of him. He says, oh, I got this. I understand. I'm right on track here. He's been a religious man all of his life. And Jesus says this to him, all these things. He says, one thing you still lack. You know, it says that after Jesus heard him say that, that like, one thing you still lack. Can you imagine hearing that from Jesus? Jesus is showing this man he doesn't have the power to live up to the Ten Commandments. In order to get into heaven, you have to be as good as God. And you're not that good. And neither am I. I'm not good enough. And, and you say, I know you're not good enough, but Pastor Jack, I'm good enough. No, you're not. You're not good enough. No one is good but God. No one is righteous, the Bible says. No one seeks God. No, not one, it says. You cannot achieve this in your own strength. Oh, but wait. Until Jesus gets to the last commandment. What does he do? What's the commandment that he brings up? He brings up the last commandment, which is thou shalt not covet. And this man covets his, his things. He likes his money and his possessions and his power. And it's really neat to see Jesus, because Jesus just puts his finger on this young man. And it's like when you go to the doctor, you know, when they, they kind of listen to what your problem is when, they first, when you first come into the doctor, Right? And they, you tell them all this stuff, and you, I, I told the doctor, I think I have indigestion. 
when I had my heart surgery, um, before I had my heart surgery. So he gave me some Prilosec, and he said, oh, yeah. He goes, mm-hmm. He goes, well, here, you can try Prilosec, but how about you go take that stress test where they're going to look at your heart when it's exercised to see what your injection fraction is. And the doctors always look at you, and they don't say anything while they're studying you. It's like they have the ability to tune you out, you know. And what Jesus does to this young man is he uncovers him. He uncovers his covetousness. And that the thing that he thinks he is, he thinks he's good enough. He's not good enough. That's what Jesus is saying. He has a, he's like any good teacher. He has a particular stinging point on the tail end. Not maliciously, Mark tells us that Jesus looks at the young man lovingly. And then he says to him, he says to him, one thing you still lack. Despite the, 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 what this young man had, he didn't have enough. Jesus taught this young man that despite all of his achievements, like having a respectful position as a ruler is not enough. Having money is not enough. His affluency wouldn't buy or open the door of heaven. Now, let me tell you something about this passage. I never had a lot of money when I was growing up. But even what I had was considered rich if you go to other countries. If you've got food on your table, you're considered rich in the world standard. His religion is not enough. Jesus brings up a good concern to a particular group of people we often meet in the church. Alistair Begg says, Pastor often hears the conversation that goes like this, whose view of things, religious, biblical, essentially goes like this. This is the way the conversation goes. If there is a God and he is good, then I am sure he will reward us as long as we're doing our best. A good God rewarding nice people as long as we are doing our best. A person who says, I try to be nice to everyone, I give as much as I can, that is my confidence. People often believe that God rewards nice people as long as we're doing our best. How often do you hear people at funerals say, yeah, they were a good person? We're just trying to justify ourselves by doing good, enough to counteract the bad, right? That's insufficient. That's what Jesus is trying to show this young man. He's not so good. He actually breaks the first commandment. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Well, what's his God? His money, you see. And so this is what Jesus is doing. He's unbraiding this young man like a physician when you walk in. But this happens, what's the same thing that happens to the young man is the same thing that happens to us sometimes when we go into the physician's office. The one thing that you still lack, Jesus gives him this sentence. All you have to do is sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. That's the remedy. He puts his finger on it. He covets the kingdom but not enough to overcome his coveting of his money. And then we see him in verse 23, but when he heard these things, he became very sad. Mark tells us he was sorrowful. The word is stronger than that. He was actually devastated. Can you imagine as a young person feeling a sense of emptiness and void? And feeling lost and thinking, I need to find out what happens. What's, what's about my next home? What about my permanent home? How am I going to get there? When Jesus said he still lacks something. So when the physician walks in and he says to you, and you start telling him after you get done, telling him all that you got, and he tells you, well, take off your clothes, get down to your underwear, and put on that paper dress that they give you to try to figure out how to tie on your own. It ties in the back or it ties in the front. I never could figure that thing out anyways. You don't need to hear about my problems. And, and the doctor puts that cold stethoscope on your back and he says, okay, breathe in. Okay, one more time. Okay, no, one more time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he looks at you through his glasses or over his glasses and he goes, mm-hmm. And he listens to you. I think I got, I think I got uh, indigestion, doctor. And he goes, mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then they diagnose the problem, and they say, well, well this, is, this is what, you, we understand what your problem is, but here's what you're going to have to go through to remedy it. And the problem is that we don't want to go through what the doctor says that we need to do to remedy it. We don't want to go through the procedure. 
And this young man does not want to go through the procedure. He actually walks away from the king of glory. You see, so he's learned that the futility of seeking salvation on your own merit, and he walks away sad. Well, this blows people out of the door that's listening to this. And Jesus turns around. He looks and he sees the sadness in this man's heart. Now, what the sting in the tail is here is then who then can be saved? You see, if it was just, you just be a nice person and you come up to Jesus and you intellectually, yeah, I believe, I believe in Jesus. If you intellectually assent to that, that you still may not be saved. That, that's not enough. And you say, you don't believe that. You believe that Jesus rewards good people. Well, look what happens to the rich young ruler. He's religious. He's enthusiastic. He's humble. He kneels before Jesus. And he says, tell me, tell me, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus says, you know the commandments. He goes, yeah, I got them all down. He goes, you, one thing you lack, you still don't have down. What he didn't understand is that he would never have a righteousness in his own effort. Jesus told the disciples, he told the people in the, in the Sermon on the Mount that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, how do I get that righteousness? Jesus told him, come and follow me. You need a righteousness that's outside of yourself, that what is impossible for man is possible for God. You see, that's the gist of the story. But that has a sting to it. And notice, Jesus gave him the remedy, but he walks away sad, still feeling the void in his life. And Jesus didn't go say, oh, you're a nice person. I'll let you in. Just join the group. No, he didn't do that. He walks away sad, sorrowful, devastated. How do we have treasure in heaven? Well, Jesus told him how to have treasure in heaven. And so we look at that. What must you do to have treasure in heaven? How, much, how, how can you be saved? Now, if you would, just keep with me and go to verse 24. Jesus called the young man to follow him, who's the author and perfecter of our faith. So there's a call upon your life. Christ isn't asking you to stay the same. He's asking you to come to him and get rid of things. To follow me means you have to transfer your trust from yourself and in investing in your own merits to trusting only in Christ. You have to put your hope in Jesus and him only. And that has a lot of connotations to it as you think about it. Look what it says there. Jesus seeing they had become sad in verse 24, how he turns around and it says in Luke, Jesus seeing that he had become sad said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And then he says, for it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, how many of you have heard this teaching? Well, the, the camel thing, you know, they, they, people want to try to get the camel through the needle. But Jesus says it's, it's impossible, basically, is what he's saying. That people, you've heard teaching, people have said, well, it has to do with the man when there was a certain gate, and if you had all your stuff on that gate, you had to take that off the camel, you had to set it aside, and then the camel could walk through, and you had to leave your stuff behind. You and the camel could get through, but you had to leave your stuff behind. Well, that actually is not what he's saying. He's saying it's impossible for a king, for a needle, or a, not a needle, to go through a camel, because that's true. But it's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. He's saying it's impossible now, what, how do we know that? Look what the disciples say in their reaction at verse 26. Who then can be saved? Who can enter the kingdom of God? That's what they're asking him. Who? It's impossible, he says. But he said, Jesus said, what is impossible with man? It's impossible on human effort alone to do it. It's impossible for human effort to save yourself but it's possible for God to save you. How? I have to listen to the call of Christ in my life. I have to take the medicine, the remedy. And the remedy is trusting in Jesus Christ for my salvation. Secondly, count the cost. That's what he said to the young man. Yesterday when they were talking to the kids and they were talking about the Hebrews passage that were surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside the weight and the sin, basically, 
that's interfering with that. Let's lay it aside. So we're to renounce all that I have and receive all that Jesus has done for me. I need to renounce, maybe like it says, Jesus says in Luke 14, 33, any one of you who does not renounce all that he cannot, all that he has cannot be my disciple. John, or on Luke 14, verse 33, renouncing may mean we give up something physically, but more often it means that we let go emotionally so that we possess no longer possesses us. We have to give up our life. We have to die to ourselves and live for Christ. You see, renounce all that I am and receive all that Christ is. Salvation is not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. And so that word laying aside all encumbrances is an interesting passage, isn't it? It's a weight. It's stuff that gets in the way. I need to be willing to lay it aside. Because it's weighing me down, and I'm going to be running the race that the Lord has given to me. I'm to follow Jesus, and following means I walk the same way Jesus walked. I follow Jesus' example. I do what he has done. I love God supremely and others sacrificially. As we think about it, laying aside that weight as well as the sin that entangles us, encumbrances or that weights, those weights can be good things. Things that get in the way of our relationship. Blessings that we've been given like money and power and privilege. Those are good things, but if they get in the way of God and they possess us, if your possessions possess you and you're not willing to give them up for Jesus, they are a God to you. And you're in dire trouble. It's not as easy as we think. Jesus said, follow me, count the cost. He didn't hesitate a minute. But this is true for this young man. It may not be true for you. You may be like the the lady at the well. She was living, she had five husbands, she had a living lover. There was a different uncovering of her, right? So each of us have to understand that God comes to us and he diagnoses the problem. What's getting in the way of your relationship with God? Count the cost, lay it aside. Get rid of it. And then run the race. That word for race, and they talked about this at the, at the, the uh, baccalaureate, that r- word for race is the word we get from our word agony. Because like sometimes when you're running a race, it's tough. You ever seen a great expression on a runner's face? Is it? Right? And so it says with endurance. So we have to run the race with endurance. And how do we run it with endurance? We have to let ourselves keep our eyes on Jesus, right? We've all heard that, the eyes on the prize. You keep your focus on him. Consider him who endured the cross so that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted, it says. Do you know what that word faint-hearted means? Discouraged and give up, basically. But remember that we're running the race that God's marked out for us. So the call of Christ, he says, follow me. Trust in me. Don't trust in your own self. Count the cost. Lay aside the encumbrances. Lay aside your sin that entangles it. Things that weigh you down and it'll stop you. And it'll be a barrier to you. And then lastly, lay up yourself treasure in heaven. Now, look at this. Look at this passage again, if you would. Go to verse 28 in your Bible. And we'll close on this. Look what Peter said. Hey, you said follow me. He didn't say it that way, but he's basically saying that. You said, follow me. See, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you. So, Jesus, so, so Peter says, what about us? What about us? Truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house, wife, or brothers, or parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and the age to come, which is eternal life. My friend, lay up treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot get to it. Run the race with endurance that is set before us. The young man walked away from Jesus sad and sorrowful. Jesus invited us to come to him and follow. Don't make the same mistake. Come and follow. Repent of your sins. Trust in Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to you in this passage... Our familiarity 
can make us vulnerable to think we already understand it like the rich young ruler thought he had it down. I pray that you would help us to know that we don't have it down. And it's not merely as easy to Jesus and sit down in front of him and assent to this intellectually. We have to really be understanding that we need to lay aside anything that's encumbering our life from Jesus. Turn away from sin and turn to Jesus. And run the race with endurance and not give up. To keep our eyes on Jesus. It's impossible for us to achieve our own salvation. What is impossible for man is possible for God to do. My friend, all you have to do is come to Jesus. You don't do anything to save yourself. Jesus has already done it for you. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and three days later rose to the newness of life and he offers us eternal life treasure in heaven, eternity, to have a home that will never have to leave. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The key part of this is to know that we have a need. Acknowledge that you need Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. Acknowledge that you have no strength within yourself and that Christ is who you're looking to. Hear the words of the benediction. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom the glory be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.